Joining me now, Stu Bergier, host of Stu Does America on the Blaze TV. Stu, thanks for joining us. I mean, this is just uh, um, absolutely crazy what's going on. I mean, we were just talking uh, previously here. Like, you can't look at Twitter or look online because, like, 10 new things happen. I mean, just in the last, you know, 12 hours alone, you know, we've had the NBA closing down, the Major League Baseball suspended, NHL, um, a whole bunch of other things. The Capitol building shut down for the first time for health reasons since 1918 uh, to the public. Um, so uh, have you seen anything like this? And uh, what, are you, what are your first reactions to this? It's incredible. I, I, you know, I will say uh, I'm kind of get paid to be the one who looks at the data, try to maybe downplays things and uh, is a little more on the calm side. And I have never seen anything like this in my entire life. This is the only thing that could even question, you know, even challenge it maybe would be 9-11 where we had, it, it felt really scary and there's a lot of things going on. But just as an example, they've canceled or at least suspended indefinitely all these sports leagues you just talked about. After 9-11, uh, baseball was off for six days uh, and then they came back and played. You know, like the flights were suspended, I think, fully for three days. We've just banned for 30 days travel to Europe, at least a, a good portion of it. Uh, it is uh, it's something I've never seen before. I, to me, it's unprecedented. It's changing the way we live. It's changing the way we interact with people. The economy is a, an utter free fall at the moment. Uh, it, these are scary times. What would you would you attribute? Because you mentioned 9-11 there. And, um, you know, when that happened, of course, like, it was just at the beginning of the of the technology era. Um, people were just starting to have cell phones. You know, there weren't the social media networks uh, like we have now. Um, so how much of this is just our connectedness and, and seeing these stories a lot quicker, kind of making everybody panic? Um, because it is a different thing. I mean, obviously, a terror attack, like you didn't know if they were going to attack again or what was planned. But you know, that's different than a quarantine where everyone's worried about a virus going around and like you're worried about touching things that other people have touched. I mean, I just went to the grocery store uh, over the, over lunch and uh, everyone was just, you know, uh, grabbing water and grabbing supplies. And I saw one lady going up to the Purell thing. You know, they have a can of, you know, bottle of Purell right there at the at the entryway. And then she stopped herself and then looked at me and laughed and was like, I don't even want to touch the stuff that everybody else is touching, <laughs> touching that's supposed to help you. So, like, we're in a whole different zone here. But how, how much of this would you say um, is, I don't know, wind aided by, you know, technology and everybody kind of seeing what's going on and causing each other to panic? Yeah, my, you're describing my most optimistic take on this right now, which <laughs> there's a part of me that believes, right, that you're seeing all these cancellations, all these major things happening that we've never seen before. I mean, you know, Italy is closed currently. They just, it's a country, they've just decided to close it. Like it's a, a restaurant went out of business. They just closed Italy. India has quarantined itself off basically completely from the rest of the world. Um, and, and, you know, when you look at all these leagues and everything, you kind of get the sense, you can make an argument in your head that's logical, which says, these things have started. People are freaked out. Nobody wants to be the per, you know, the company, the league that stays open, and one of their fans or one of their players gets sick and it blows up. And as soon as one league, which the NBA did last night, cuts cuts it, everybody else is going to cut it because you just can't be on the wrong side of that. That makes sense in some ways. Doesn't make sense with something like Italy closing down, right? Doesn't make sense with India quarantining itself. Um, and I think like when you look at it from the opposite side, which is really, I think, where I'm not a panicked guy. You know, I know you, we've known each other forever. Neither one of us really, you know, are going to panic over anything. Um, but there is that part of me that says you have to judge by context at some level. Neither of us are virology. We're not going to go into like study viruses under microscopes. Right. You look at the, just the context of what people are doing. And, you know, South by Southwest is a festival that, that has a economic impact of $350 million and they just canceled it. And it was like barely even a story this week. Uh, these things are so big. The moves are so dramatic uh, that you have to believe that everybody who's looked at this information is seeing it and seeing real danger if we don't change the way we interact immediately to minimize the damage. And then hopefully it goes back to normal in, in not too long of time. You're a stat guy. And, um, you know, I've seen a lot of different stats flying around here. You know, the different mortality rates. Uh, you know, we're seeing wild variations, you know, around the world. You know, Italy has a super high rate um, compared to South Korea, who's got a low rate. 
Um, so what what should we believe on the stats? Like what are what are you seeing that is sort of the uh, consensus at this point uh, when it comes to you know how many people are getting this, how many people are surviving, and uh, or is it too early to tell for sure? It's it's definitely too early to know for sure. But I mean, one of the things that's interesting about this is if you think about like um, there's a certain amount of uh, poison you can have that's a lethal dose, right? So every time you have a certain amount of poison, you can have uh, if you have that amount, it's a lethal dose most likely. It's not exactly the way a case fatality rate works. It's different in different countries. It's different at different times. Um, you know, the virus mutates and it changes over time. And, and the way a, a, a country responds to it really alters this rate. So um, in South Korea, which has had a decent amount of cases, largely based on a couple of really, uh, they were called one a super spreader. One person infected like 1,300 people somehow. Which yeah, is like a that, crazy was, that was actually a story that we reported on, Stu, uh, from a cult church. Mm. Uh, and I think it was patient 31 or something like that. And that's right. Um, did, was advised to go and, you know, quarantine, but then didn't and just went around and like went to a buffet and did basically everything that you shouldn't do. And it's, yeah, it's like a crazy. wild story. Um, but I mean, that case kind of blows this, uh, their cases uh, sort of uh, out of the water. But like their death rate is actually very low. It's been, you know, 0.5, 0.6. We've seen this when with the cruise ship, it was around 0.8 percent. Um, now, that's still high compared to the flu. But this, what they're finding is the, the countries that are really reacting in a hardcore sort of way, you know, locking everything down. This is why Italy has decided to move this direction now. It's those countries that are able to have a dent here. And like a lot of people keep bringing up the flu, which is there's a lot of parallels, even though it's not necessarily the it's not a perfect parallel. But if you think about that, this is the flu, but it's the flu year one. The flu year one was 1918. And that was a really bad year. Uh, it was really ugly. We had no treatments for it. 1918 and 1919 are brutal. We're, we're com trying to compare year one of this virus to year 102 of the Spanish flu. It's totally different. Over time, we'll bring those those uh, rates down. I guess My guess is it will be under 1% um, even for this year eventually. Um, but when we get vaccines, we get treatments. You know, we'll we'll move quickly to get that rate down. It's the immediate uh, first and second year sort of flare up of this when we have no defense. We're just kind of yeah. sitting here. It's like the flu with no flu shot. It can be really, really scary, particularly for those who already have existing medical conditions. What do you make of let's transition here into the politics of this, because, you know, like it or not, we're in the middle of a presidential election that's coming up in, you know, six months or so. And, uh, you know, I get well, I guess, what, eight months. So um, but we're in the middle of this presidential election and um, like it or not, we're going to see the media um, and, and other people who don't like Trump, critics of Trump. They're going to criticize everything this guy does. And, you're, you know, and then his supporters are going to probably tend to try to support everything that he does. And so, um, you know, what do you make of that dynamic going forward? And, and before we get to there and to the implications of it, let's let's back up there here for a second and talk about just how he did, first of all, on his speech last night. Um, because of course the critics were criticizing and his supporters were supporting. So what, what should we actually make of his speech? How did he do, uh, in regards, uh, to trying to assure the public that they've got this thing handled, at least that they're doing the best they can. Yeah. I mean, look, uh, Trump's done, I think, uh, many good things while he's in office. Um, the Oval Office speech in a moment of crisis, I don't think that's his strong suit per se. Um, you know, look, uh, there's a lot to praise about, I think his first term, um, but we've seen a lot of it with this incident really fade away. I mean, you know, his economic strength has been the strength of his in entire presidency. And as of today, uh, it was 92 percent of the stock market gains since he was inaugurated have gone away basically in the past few weeks. Um, it it's been a wild ride. You know, I think he got he got some facts wrong uh, in the speech and it was not you know, it's not really his game. Trump is really good at certain things that that's not really his vibe. That's really more of a Mike Pence vibe, I would say that type of speech. Um, and it opens it opens him up to uh, a lot of criticism. Some of it some of it deserved, some of it not. I mean, this is the problem with the way that we are right now. Um, it's a completely understandable instinct for both sides to just basically go to their corners and do what they do. You know, say Donald Trump is at fault for the entire thing. He probably invented the virus in, in Trump Tower and released it intentionally. Uh, and then the other side will say he's doing nothing wrong. And the only reason they're even talking about this is to, is to hype it up. I've heard that from, you know, a decent amount of conservatives who 
understandably think that this is just being hyped by the media. It can't possibly be this big of a deal. And that's a real problem because it is a big deal. And you know this. You watched Trump last night. He didn't look like he was playing around. He's not trying to sink his own presidency by hyping it. Um, so you look at this kind of and you step back and you say when it comes to the political ramifications, which are obviously way down the road, as you point out, it's not the highest priority by any means. But if Donald Trump comes off in this situation looking incompetent, if he looks like he's overwhelmed by something like this, the American people are not going to elect him. If this economy falls apart because of something like this, he's not going to be president of the United States anymore. He, it's something he really needs to consider. He started this off with a lot of kind of uh, blowing it off. It was a lot of like, yeah, you know, we're going to be fine. We got a couple cases. It's going to go down to zero really soon. Don't worry about it. We're all over it. And sort of, you know, minimize the, the threat of it, which there's some argument for, right? Like you're the president. You want to calm markets. Right. You want to calm people down. You don't want to freak people out. But, you know, that's the way he does it. He kind of just downplays things and, and kind of blows it off. And I don't think his administration is blowing it off. I think, you know, they've done a lot of things that have, have, have moved this around uh, and moved it along a little bit. But the thing where he's going to get lots of criticism is the fact that we are testing at a rate much lower than everyone else involved in this situation. We had an issue with the tests initially. It's a long story, but basically we rejected the World Health Organization tests. And uh, we tried to do our own. We had issues with our own. It's taken a long time for these things to get to the right places. And so we're just not testing enough people. We really don't know how many tests we have. People believe that it could be tens of thousands already, um, but we don't know. And without knowing, there's no way to test who these people are interacting with. We don't know where, how to trace it back to the original patients that are spreading it. We are flying blind right now. Um, and, you know, when it comes to politics, look, if this thing gets taken care of, there's so many news cycles, you know, he could probably turn it around. If the economy bounces back, everything would be fine for his, his election. But I think a lot of people on the right minimize the impact that this can have. Dan, you remember going back, we worked together back in 2004, where, um, uh, you know, uh, George Bush was uh, got reelected um, and then went into 2005 and it was Hurricane Katrina. And while there are a lot of arguments that uh, that were, you know, launched at the president at that time, some of them were fair, some of them were not. The perception of the public was that he was incompetent in handling that, and it blew up his presidency in large part. And the same thing could happen to Trump if he comes off as aloof or incompetent in any way. He's going to have major trouble. This is a serious situation, and they really do need to treat it seriously. Yeah, that's uh, all interesting information there. And uh, one question uh, regarding those tests, Stu, because you, you mentioned that that's a key a key, a key uh, sticking point here is we've got to get more, more of these tests out so we know what's going on. Uh, I saw someone tweet this and I thought, good question. Maybe you have an answer. But, you know, we see the guys on the Utah Jazz and they're getting tested like right away. And it's like, well, wait a minute. How come these guys are all getting tested <laughs> right away? And, you know, regular schmoes around don't seem to be getting tested. Like I, I saw some ridiculously low stat. Um, like it seemed like it was in like, I don't know, less than 100 people that had been tested or something like that uh, that we know yeah. about. And it's like, well, how are we supposed to, you know, wh why are some people able to get these tests seemingly so quick? Or do we just have like 10 of them and we're like just kind of waiting? <laughs> it depends on how much you, you you earn per year. If you earn a certain amount a year, you get as many tests as you want. No, I'm <laughs> kidding. Um, I think it's up to like something like 700 people we've tested okay. now, which is still ridiculously right. low. They're doing like 5,000 a day in much smaller countries than us. And that's why they're able to really track it and be able to keep separate people and quarantine them. Um, you know, it's interesting the, you wonder if the profile of the person does play into this, right? I mean, being able to uh, kind of, uh, you know, draw, know that you're a high sort of attention um, and, and, and profile person. Um, you know, this is something that is significant. It's possible that they know as soon as they get a positive test in the NBA, they're going to cancel it. And maybe people are waking up. I think, you know, the difference between having an authoritarian government and having a free um, uh, society like we do is really good all the time with the possible exception of infectious disease, because, you know, an, an authoritarian government can just kind of come in and do whatever they want. And it's easy to get under control. <laughs> the trade off is not worth it by any no. means. Um, definitely not. Um, but but you, you can see how these things uh, could develop. Um, and the average person who wants to get access to these things, they're just literally not available right now. We don't have them. Uh, that's that is the thing I think 
the administration needs to explain. Um, there is sort of a backstory there, it's, it, but it's complicated, and there is a, a, a story of failure so far on that front. Yeah. There's still plenty of time to get this right, uh, but the, the action needs to happen because, you know, this is one of those exponential things. If, if it gets out of control, um, it could get really ugly really fast, and even if the death rate is as low as we hope it is, you're still talking about a lot of human life. You know, too many people are throwing out this thing. Oh, well, you know, it's, it's uh, 70 and 80 year olds. It's only 70 and 80 year olds. Yeah, well, those are people. Those are our parents. Those are our grandparents. They may be you. Uh, those people really matter. Uh, if we care about life in the room, we also care about life in their 70s and 80s. This is this is really important stuff. Um, so we have to make sure we're all over this, uh, you know, not just for the political concerns, which are, you know, a million thin line. But, you know, this is massive human life at risk. And if we don't do the right things at the right time, we could this could get out of our hands really fast. All right, Stu Bergier from Stu Does America on the Blaze TV. Thank you for joining us, and uh, uh, you know, keep washing those hands and stay uh, stay Corona free down there. I'm trying not to lick any doorknobs, Dan. <laughs>